Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from Behringer Ingelheim. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello, I am Dr. Javed Butler, President of Baylor Scott & White Research Institute in Dallas, Texas, and Distinguished Professor of Medicine at the University of Mississippi in Jackson, Mississippi. Welcome to this program titled, International Heart Failure Guidelines and the Latest Data. Out of Complexities, Simplicities Emerge with SGLT2 Inhibitors. Joining me today, I am really fortunate, are both the co-chairs for the European Society of Cardiology Guidelines, as well as the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, and Heart Failure Society of America guidelines as well. So first, Dr. Beacon Boscott, Professor of Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, who is the co-chair of the American Heart Failure Guidelines. Beacom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Javed. And Dr. Teresa McDonough, Professor and Consultant Cardiologist at King's College London in the United Kingdom, who was the co-chair of the European Heart Failure Guidelines. Teresa, welcome. Thank you, Javed. So in the recent past, there is a wealth of clinical trial data that has come out related to the management of patients with heart failure. Multiple clinical trials have been positive, and now we are getting some data in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction patients also with more than one trial positive. So lots to discuss and lots to figure out how all of these data have shaped the guidelines and how the guideline writers have put all of this information together to guide the program. So in this program, we will discuss some of these data and guidelines which have evolved regarding the contemporary management of patients with heart failure. So Teresa, maybe I can start with you. The 2021 ESC guidelines just published a new set of uh, uh, recommendations for the management of heart failure patients. Can you just bring us up to date? What, uh, what's uh, the latest and the greatest in HEFREF? Okay, thank you. Well, we had a lot of new evidence to consider. Uh, we didn't have anything, any new data for ACE inhibitors, ARBs, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists or beta blockers, but obviously we had to consider DAPA-HF with DAPA-glyphosin and, and Emperor reduced with Empaglyphosin. So we've now, in addition to three uh, foundational therapies for uh, heart failure, gone on to the SGLT2 inhibitors, DAPA-glyphosin and Empaglyphosin, having class 1A evidence for treatment uh, of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So they, we now have, if in, in our new algorithm, really four foundational therapies in the ESC guideline. It's starting with an ACE inhibitor and then switching to uh, scubitrol valsartan if the patient remains symptomatic as one pillar, MRAs, beta blockers, and SGLT2 uh, inhibitors as foundational first-line therapies uh, for heart failure. Um, we've also gone away from the traditional sequencing of starting with an ACE inhibitor, up titrating, adding a beta blocker, adding an MRA, um, then uh, adding an SGLT2 inhibitor to saying that these treatments really should be started as quickly uh, and as safely as possible. So, Teresa, you mentioned that there is a emphasis on early treatment and a de-emphasis on sequencing because these patients come in various different phenotypes. Can you just expand on that a little bit? I, I think it's very important when we consider not sequencing drugs as they were in the trials to think a little bit more carefully and holistically about the patient. And in terms of thinking about the phenotype for starting various drugs in various orders, really, I would emphasize we've really got heart rate, we've got blood pressure, we've got, we've got renal function, and we've got uh, hyperkalemia or hypokalemia to, to think about. Um, so I think um, you need to look at the patient in front of you. If renal dysfunction is a problem, you might want to start uh, 
with a beta blocker and SGLT2 inhibitor. You know, if hypotension is a problem, you probably would want to again uh, think about the SGLT2 inhibitor, maybe the MRE. Um, if symptoms and renal function is okay and blood pressure is okay, the ARNI uh, first of all. So I think there are many, there, there are a lot, of phen a lot of different phenotypes, and there has been a recent paper by the HFA putting together, I think, 13 phenotypes, combinations of heart rate, blood pressure, renal dysfunction, atrial fibrillation, and sinus rhythm. Um, and I'm sure AI will work this out for us in due course, but I, I think just think of the, the patient in front of you, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and their renal function, and do go with the things which are going to cause least harm, first of all, and then add in the others. So in other words, what you're saying is that until that super AI comes, we still need to be doctors. We still need, we to, still need doctors, to see yeah. the patient yeah. and use clinical Usually judgment. Clinical judgment, yeah. So Begum, let me, let me come to you. You know, so this, so, so there were two things I, I heard uh, Teresa mention. One is that sort of sequencing is a little bit more of a historical construct. Not our, all our patients are the same, so you may not be able to apply the same algorithm, but just get all the drugs. Uh, but then the issue of early initiation of therapy. So can you expand a little bit on this notion of early and, and why so much focus on early initiation? All the trials have demonstrated the new um, agents, especially with SGLT2 inhibitors and also with ARNI, that we start seeing the benefit quite early, especially with SGLT2 inhibitors, as early as 18 days. And thus, the rapidity by which these need to be achieved truly is associated with clinical outcomes. So this is very similar to what cancer has done. There is a urgency of having to optimize to save lives and improve outcomes. And thus, complacency as well as inertia, I don't think is acceptable at this point. In the U.S. guidelines, very similar to the ESC guidelines, we emphasize as a first step optimization uh, with a core quadruple foundational therapy with SGLT2 inhibition in addition to ARNI, beta blockade, MRA. Um, and the concept of how you get there, again, is not prescriptively uh, specified, but left to the discretion of the physician, but we emphasize as early as possible. And your question about early, you can initiate it during hospitalization pre-discharge, you can initiate it in the outpatient setting. The concept is try to achieve the quadruple therapy as quickly as possible, not according to the historical sequencing of the, how the clinical trials were conducted, but according to the specific etiology, phenotype of the patient, the concept is getting the quadruple therapy on board. So if somebody comes in with myocardial infarction, you know, new first myocardial infarction, you know, two, three, four days, we start five, six new classes of medications. So why does it take? Now, obviously, outpatient is a different setting, but it still it should not take months on end. And these patients are at a higher risk of sudden cardiac death. And then we take months and months on end, and then the inertia sets in. And a lot of the time, these therapies are not even given. Uh, so there is, there is this sort of real risk of, of not giving the therapies to the patient. So Teresa, new onset heart failure, somebody showed up uh, short of breath in the emergency room uh, and just got diagnosed as, as hospitalized. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, quadruple therapy, new onset heart failure? How would you approach it? Well, I, I think we have now good evidence for many of these classes of drugs that they can be started safely in hospital. So we have data, obviously, with Secubitril Valsartan from the Pioneer study, that it's safe. To, there are no more there are no more side effects from starting um, Arni in hospital than there is uh, with starting a Ramipril. We know from the SGLT2 inhibitors, the Solus trial with Sotagliflozin looked at patients with diabetes, but who were hospitalised with with actually with both reduced and heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, that there was a benefit um, from, uh, from starting uh, sotoglyphosin in the inpatient setting. And again, most recently with empagliflozin in the impulse trial, uh, when patients with acute heart failure uh, were randomized to empagliflozin versus placebo in hospital, there was a benefit in terms of uh, uh, outcomes in terms of uh, quality of life um, and, and uh, symptoms uh, for, for starting empagliflozin in hospital. So, Begum, let me come to you. There is a little bit of a confusion out there. So, we are de-emphasizing sequential therapy, and there is focus on simultaneous therapy, but some folks sort of may have the propensity to take the word simultaneously too literally, that at Thursday afternoon at 12.05 for the first time take all four pills together. What, what exactly do you mean by simultaneous initiation? 
Great question. Um, the concept of which agents to start together, I think, is being addressed for specific phenotypes. The concept is looking at uh, patient's etiology. For example, the post-MI. Yes, we may be initiating the beta blockade and RAS inhibition first, but we will be considering probably the addition of MR and HGLT2 inhibitors quickly. Or in a patient NYHA class 2 heart failure as an outpatient, yes, you may be able to initiate two or sometimes three and add the other one within a week. So the sequence as well as the uh, rapidity by which these are to be escalated can be individualized. Look also for intersectionality of the indications. One other very important concept is keep in mind the new agents actually allow us to be able to facilitate initiation of the other agent due to their safety. At this point, we have evidence that SGLT2 inhibition, uh, as well as RNA, have beneficial effects on the kidney. Thus, the historical concerns about what would happen to the kidney or potassium are no longer as much of a concern in majority of our patients. And we now have evidence that these agents, when started together, actually are able to be tolerated better uh, with a very um, acceptable safety profile. So the new agents facilitate initiation of other foundational therapies. Uh, you can initiate two or three together, not all at the same time at one hour. I like to spread them apart through the day and try to um, choose the regimen that is going to be tolerated best. And again, that will depend on the patient as well as the profile of the hemodynamic characterization, blood pressure, and so forth. No, no, absolutely. So, right, you know, if you have a person who's really congested, Unlikely to tolerate beta blocker, but RD and SGLT2 in a beta both leads to natriuresis, diuresis, so maybe tolerated better. Uh, not perfect science, observational data again, uh, but there is sizable data that SGLT2 inhibitor lowered the risk of hyperkalemia, so MRA may be better tolerated. So again, a lot of sort of clinical uh, sense that, that you can uh, use. So Teresa mentioned something about uh, in-hospital initiation. Do you have a perspective on, on uh, uh, why is it important that if possible, not mandatory, but if possible, that treatment should be started in the hospital setting before a person goes home? Absolutely. We have data that if not initiated in the hospital, they never get initiated as an outpatient. So this has been demonstrated by both U.S. and European uh, registries that it's critical for patients, especially these are very high-risk patients, and the trials have shown benefit and thus um, delay in um, initiation of treatment is not acceptable at this point. We have the safety data, we have the efficacy data, and we do recognize when not initiated, these agents will not be initiated. So it's important for us to use this opportunity, initiate them early, and pre-discharge. The second concept that I'm going to emphasize, we are very similar to the European Society of Cardiology guidelines of having a class one recommendation of initiation of guideline-directed therapy pre-discharge. Once hemodynamic um, stability is achieved, patient is not in shock, these agents should be initiated. Uh, we also have another recommendation in the US guidelines for not to withhold uh, guideline-directed therapy for these transient rise in creatinine or transient drop in blood pressure, which unfortunately creates this uh, knee uh, jerk reflex of holding the therapies. We know when the creatinine is elevated along with the um, a successful decongestion, it's not associated with worse outcomes. Or when the slight rise in creatinine is seen with RAS inhibition, or even with SGLT2 inhibition, they're not associated with worse outcomes. If anything, with SGLT2 inhibitors, we know in the long run there's benefit in the kidney. And thus, we don't recommend withholding therapies for these transient rise in creatinine or transient drop in blood pressure, but continuation for those who have been on GDMT and also consideration of in initiation before discharge. You know, what you're saying is so incredibly important, and in some settings, it may actually even be worse that even without the rise in creatinine, in anticipation, sometimes these medications and decompensated patients are just a stop. So, so it's sort of uh, unfortunate that when your neurohormonal system is most revved up is when we withdraw these medication and then we sort of put patients at, at high risk. Now, I just want to sort of clarify for our, our listeners here, the best time to start these medications is in the outpatient setting so that you can prevent hospitalization in the first place. But if somebody does get hospitalized, please realize 
that their entire trajectory, the natural history of the disease process has changed and they are at a much higher risk and not miss that opportunity and try to initiate all the therapies, preferably as it mentioned, class one recommendation in the hospital setting or soon thereafter uh, post-discharge. So we heard a little bit uh, from Teresa about the European guidelines. Our American guidelines, a little different, a lot different, exactly the same. We are harmonized um, for, uh, for the foundational core quadruple therapy in heart failure with reduced EF. We have very similar recommendations for initiation of SGLT2 inhibition along with um, ARNI, beta blockade, and MRA as a quadruple therapy in heart failure with reduced EF. Our EF classifications are very similar, heart failure with reduced EF, mild reduced EF, as well as preserved EF. We do have another category called heart failure with improved EF, for which we do have a recommendation to continue guideline-directed therapy for those who have had a heart failure with reduced EF at baseline with a subsequent EF measurement that may have reached a category of improved EF with EF more than 40%. Other areas that we have some nuanced differences are um, in the quadruple therapy, we do recommend initiation of ARNI as a de novo recommendation as class one. Uh, that is a class two recommendation, the de novo um, for ARNI in ESC guidelines. Um, for the step two additional therapies, we're very much harmonized for ivabradine being a class 2A, Verisiguad and digoxin being class 2B recommendations. We also have hydralazine and nitrates in African-American or black patients as a class 1 recommendation. That is a class 2 recommendation in the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. We also in the, United, uh, in the American guidelines have the stages of heart failure um, which now have been revised as heart patients at risk for heart failure, pre-heart failure, heart failure, and advanced heart failure. For each of these stages, we have specific recommendations, including SGLT2 inhibition for patients with diabetes, for prevention of heart failure, for patients at risk of heart failure, as well as pre-heart failure. And the pre-heart failure now has the definition that includes not only structural or functional heart disease, but um, abnormality in biomarkers, especially with elevation of natriuretic peptide and or cardiac troponin levels. And um, overall, the, the remainder of the guidelines are very harmonized. And um, not only are they harmonized with the um, ESC guidelines, but we're very much harmonized with the Canadian um, Society of Cardiology as well as heart failure guidelines um, from most of these societies. So that's great. So, so the regulatory agencies, uh, both sides are thinking about the same thing. The indications are pretty similar. And now the guidelines and the professional societies are thinking about it uh, similarly as well. Uh, the Canadian guidelines came out. They were also very similar, almost identical. And then the Japanese guidelines came out, and they were also pretty similar. So, you know, whether it's North America or Europe or, or, or Asia, all these guidelines are saying the same thing. Now, the issue is uh, how do we move forward and we uh, implement. Uh, a, a little bit of a nuanced question to you, uh, Beacom. Uh, so you mentioned a specific category of improved ejection fraction, but please don't stop the therapy, continue the therapy. Uh, if the improved ejection fraction equals to normalization of ejection fraction, would you still say the same? Absolutely. Even if the EF improves to more than 50%, we don't consider this preserved EF. It's improved EF. And we know from the thread hf trial that withdrawal, the withdrawal of therapy results in relapse in a significant proportion of patients who actually had total resolution of their symptoms and normalization of EF. So with that data, we do have a recommendation not to uh, change therapy, but continue guideline-directed therapy for those who have improvement in their EF. Great. Well, thank you very much for that. So when our European colleagues were writing the guidelines, Emperor Preserve results had just come out, so they didn't have the time to sort of really digest those results and uh, deliver was, was nowhere in the, in the view. Uh, when you were writing your American guidelines, you had a little bit more time to think about Emperor Preserve. So uh, let's move the discussion a little bit about HEFPEF. Uh, is HEFPEF one monolithic category? How do you define it? And uh, what, what are the recommendations now? It certainly is not monolithic, uh, but our job was easier uh, than the European Society of Cardiology guidelines because we did have the benefit of being able to include emperor preserved. 
Uh, we do know it's a very heterogeneous group, but Emperor Preserved, which included patients with heart failure with ejection fraction more than 40%, showed significant improvement in cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalizations in symptomatic heart failure patients. Uh, majority of the benefit was due to reduction in cardiovascular um, heart, heart failure hospitalizations. Um, and overall, the benefit was seen very early with the separation of the curves. With these in mind, we have now a class 2A recommendation uh, for um, SGLT2 inhibition for patients with heart failure with preserved EF. And this is a new recommendation in the American guidelines. We do have MRA um, as well as uh, ARBs as a class 2B recommendation, but keep in mind those agents' benefits were actually confirmed with postdoc analyses of former trials, with, which included patients with EF over 40%. We also have now very fresh data from the DELIVER um, a trial results uh, by, the, by the news release that it did meet its primary endpoint of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization with dapagliflozin. Thus, we have a second trial that recently got released uh, by press release supporting the results of the Emperor Preserve trial. And thus, I think the, there's stronger evidence now for, um, for SGLT2 inhibition for patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So in some sense, this is really momentous in our field, right? Up until now, there was not a single trial that met its primary endpoint, though several trials came pretty close, uh, which then leads us to this whole discussion that why did they come close? And then when you start sparsing the ejection fraction, uh, this issue of heart failure with mildly reduced or the previously known as mid-range ejection fraction comes up. Uh, so are your guidelines when you say have PEF, that's the clinical trials are over 40%? Is it the same? guideline for everyone, or are there different guidelines for mid-range and uh, uh, preserved, preserved? So we do have separate recommendations for HEFREF, mildly reduced EF, and HEFPEF. Now, HEFPEF and mildly reduced EF look quite similar, but there are some nuanced differences there. For HEFPEF and mildly reduced EF, SGLT2 inhibition has a class 2A recommendation. So in both of these categories, it's a 2A. Heart failure with reduced EF, it's a class one. So for any uh, uh, patient with heart failure with EF exceeding that of 40%, it's a class 2A recommendation in essence. Um, for the other agents in mildly reduced EF, we pretty much gave beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, ARNI, MRA, a class 2B recommendation for mildly reduced EF. For heart failure with preserved EF, on the other hand, we only have data with MRA, an ARB um, as, a, um, as an additional consideration beyond the SGLT2 inhibition in heart failure with preserved EF, it's a class 2A. For MRA and ARB, it's a 2B recommendation for heart failure with preserved EF. We do not have benefit or evidence of benefit with beta blockade. So we don't have the beta blockers as a recommendation in heart failure with preserved EF. For mildly reduced and PEF, the data comes from uh, Emperor preserved one trial, therefore it's given a class 2A indication. So Teresa, let me come to you. So you didn't have the luxury of Emperor preserved, but you did have all the other trials. So did you sort of read uh, those data as subgroups and make some recommendations for mildly reduced ejection fraction? We did. I mean, we looked obviously at some meta-analysis and subgroup analysis of many of the HEF, uh, PEF trials. Of course, at the time, we didn't have Emperor Preserved, so we were really, of course, looking at subgroup analysis of neutral trials or trials which did not meet their primary endpoint. So for ARNI, for um, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers and MRAs, we went for class 2B level C recommendations for this. They may be considered in mm -hmm. patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Um, for HEF-PEF, we didn't obviously have Emperor Preserved, and therefore we were left with, again, neutral trials for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So um, we, we, we opted not to make uh, hard recommendations. So our only actual difference for mildly reduced ejection fraction is we've got class 2B for um, everything and we have, don't have SGLT2, because of course you had two trials then to put together to give a 2A for the SGLT2 inhibitors.
we were lucky to yeah, have yeah. had the Emperor <laughs> Reserve published before the release of the guidelines. I am so uh, uh, anxious to, to see the delivered results in detail because there has been so much discussion. Now, in the Emperor trial, you know, we had the luxury of having LVEF known in about almost 10,000 patients between Emperor Reduce and Emperor Preserve. So we kind of put all of that together uh, to look at across the range of ejection fraction. Uh, and then if you sort of look at the data, there is no statistical heterogeneity. The point estimate at the higher EF gets lesser. And then you see this sort of weird pattern that from 65 to 70, it gets less, and then from 70, it gets better. So I don't know how to interpret all that. It seems like that it works across the spectrum of ejection fraction, uh, but I think with Deliver, we will learn a lot uh, as to this, the, the, the super PEF, the super normal ejection fraction, the 65, 70% of the people, how are they different and what is going on uh, in those patients? But at least for the time being, it seems like uh, diuretics and SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are good therapy across the range of ejection fraction. The other thing that makes this whole discussion a little bit more difficult is that we do these large trials, five, six, seven thousand patients, uh, and we don't systematically rule out amyloidosis. We don't systematically rule out obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And therefore, you know, my uh, earlier comment that you made about this is not a monolith and, and that there may be different phenotypes. Uh, so, so lots to learn, but nevertheless, to have a therapy now that has a positive trial and have PEF and, and have some data that shows that the benefit uh, is across the spectrum uh, of ejection fraction is really interesting. So Teresa, let me, let me come back to you on this one. So uh, on one hand, we are all excited that we have a REF and a PEF and the same SGLT2 class seems to be benefiting all. But then if you see sort of some of the corridor chat uh, in the meetings, they're saying that, oh, LVEF is now irrelevant. Your comment. Well, I think LVEF as a concept is in evolution. Um, I wouldn't say it's about to become completely extinct, but I think what we're seeing now is that many of the drugs, be it more specifically ARNI, SGLT2 inhib inhibitors, work up really up until into the normal, you know, just to below the normal range of ejection fraction. So I think these categ seeing categories of less than 40, 41 to 49, uh, it, it, that is not going to make much sense in the future if the drugs are all working when people have reject left ventricular ejection fractions which are below normal, whatever that is. It might be 55% in men, maybe even up to 60% in women. Then I, I think these subcategories that we've got based on ejection fraction will become obsolete, and we will have drugs which um, work in patients with reduced left ventricular systolic function. And then we have to, of course, then think a little bit about those with heart failure with normal ejection fraction. Yeah, I think that's the way that it yeah. will be going in the future. At least go from three to two categories. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if I may add, I think I fully agree. Yeah. Um, certain medications, which right now we're weaving the continuum all the way yeah. from the prevention to the symptomatic heart failure, regardless of EF, especially with SGLT2 inhibition, uh, but comes the point of the devices. For the devices, yes. EF always is going to be relevant. Yeah. And thus, this whole concept, the journey of where does the EF improve to? We know that SGLT2 inhibition as well as ARNI, uh, in addition to the other agents, uh, do result in reversal of remodeling. And thus, the magnitude of benefit is not just for clinical endpoints, but also for reversal of remodeling, which is critical for us to optimize these therapies before looking at the F again to see the ICD as well as maybe CRT integrations. And from that perspective, EF always is going to be relevant. The second concept is there may be other additional therapies for which the EF may be still important, especially when the therapies are targeting the pump. Yes. We had always used EF as a surrogate for severity of heart failure. If the agent is um, effective regardless of the phenotype or the severity um, of heart failure, EF may not be pertinent. But if, let's say, the therapy is targeting the pump and or a certain severe heart failure phenotype, i.e. the severe, you know, advanced heart failure, EF may be per pertinent. Thus, I think EF is still going to be part of our armamentarium, though not possibly for indications for certain agents. Now makes makes a, a total sense. And I also want to point out that although our discussion today 
was based on, was all focused on guidelines. Our guidelines are focused on the primary endpoints that were specified in the clinical trials. Uh, these agents have also been shown to improve quality of life scores as well, and that is critically important to our patients, not only to live longer, not come into the hospital, but feel better at, uh, as well. Can I ask you one last question and squeeze one more in? So you talked about stages, you talked about EF categorization, you talked about the uh, improvement uh, in ejection fraction, but in your guidelines, you also have this issue of trajectories. Do any of these therapies change based on the trajectory? What is the trajectory classification? It's critical. Um, there, we are aware of complacency and inertia amongst uh, clinicians, especially for perceived stability. So we have emphasized, don't use stable heart failure, but persistent heart failure. So those individuals with active symptoms, they have persistent heart failure. This is very similar to active cancer. So what would you do in active cancer? You would optimize therapy, regardless of how stable it looks. So in persistent heart failure, optimize meaning optimize the quadruple yeah. therapy, consider additional therapies. This is very similar to the urgency of what we have with cancer because heart failure is a deadly disease. For those individuals who have resolution of their symptoms, we do consider those with low EF still stage C. Stage C or high heart failure could be individuals with history of symptomatic heart failure or current heart failure, those individuals still need to be optimized on guidelines right. rated therapy. For those with resolution of symptoms and improvement in their EF, which is the category of EF, improved EF, those need to be continued. So I have two verbs, optimize and continue. Optimize in persistent heart failure, optimize in stage C, okay? and improved EF, continue, continue the guideline-directed therapies. I, I don't think that it could end at a better point. Optimize and continue. So let me just summarize this robust discussion we had. So I would uh, definitely encourage our uh, audience members to look at the guidelines. A lot of the data have been put together, but what we basically learned is that the therapy for heart, fa heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, foundational therapy, is now four-drug therapy, not three-drug therapy. The sequencing is not emphasized. What is emphasized is just to get the patients on the right medications as soon as possible and don't give in to inertia. At least give low doses, but it's always preferable to give the doses used in the clinical trials. That we now actually have data that are positive for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as well. And at least the SGLT2 inhibitor class seems to work across the spectrum of ejection fraction. And we have another positive trial uh, delivered that will be coming out with full results as well. And we also talked about the fact that if somebody is in the hospital, please take that as an opportunity and not let them leave the hospital without optimizing therapy, and if somebody's ejection fraction improves, that's not a good reason to stop the therapy. Quadruple therapy as soon as possible, safely. That will improve the quality of life of your patients, but as well as increase survival in multiples of years. So I will stop here. Teresa, thank you so much. Beacom, thank you so much. This was a lot of information, and I have to say, it is really a pleasure to have both the co-chairs sitting with us from Europe and America who have actually written the guidelines. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you as well for participating in this activity. Please continue on to answer the question that follows and complete the evaluation. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.